questions, and I'd like for you to go ahead and feel free to respond. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about culture and how our culture has changed. And one of the big things that, that's been in the news for many, many years now is how rapidly changing our culture really is. So what I'd like for you to do is to think back over the last five years and what cultural changes have taken place in the last five years that you want to just mention. Just, just mention them briefly, if you would. Something that has changed the way we do things in America in the last five years. Uh, electronics, yes, those have just really increased and improved through the years. Yeah. The Sun Pass, there you go. What a blessing the Sun Pass is. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that a Sun Pass? It, 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 when you have to pay tolls on the, on the highway, you, just, you get this pass and you don't have to go through the toll booth. You don't have to pay, though. Yeah. Yeah, that's when you still have to pay. So, yeah. <laughs> medicine, how medicine has improved through the years. Yeah. I'll bet you the medicines they've given Taylor right now weren't even invented five years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, how about 10 years? Go back 10 years. What are some of the cultural changes that have taken place in the last 10 years? Right. Education? How so? Better and more of it. Okay. Okay. You might ask some of the teachers if they'd agree with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, cell phones, our, our cell phone coverage has improved and our, yeah. Okay. What's that? Health insurance, is making some significant changes, yeah. Facebook, yeah, in the last 10 years, Facebook. And how about 20 years? Can, can, you, can some of you remember back 20 years? What's that? Email. Email in the last 20 years, yes. Big significant difference. Mm -hmm. You had legs back then, yes, you did. <laughs> you could dance, couldn't you, Bernice? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, what's that? Computers. Yeah. The, really, the advent of the computers uh, only been about 30 years ago. Those, those on our desks. Well, I've had more opportunity to think about that than you, so I've come up with some ideas. I did a little bit of research, and, and what I, here's some of the things that I've discovered. Um, 20 years ago, uh, there was the advent of cable TV, and that has significantly changed the way we view things on TV. Cable TV started with, I think, six cable stations 20 years ago. And along with that came a couple of, uh, of networks called the 24-hour news networks, like CNN. You know, and they have significantly changed our culture. Yeah. Microwave ovens became a necessity before they were a luxury. Yeah. Instant messenger. Somebody said emails. Instant messenger. How many of you remember instant messenger? Yeah, that, that was a way you could talk to somebody by only typing. Yeah. Uh, the, the debate over illegal immigration was starting to raise its head those days. It is a real hot button topic today. Uh, the stock market became more affluent. Restaurants and shopping centers became the source of entertainment. You didn't go to a restaurant just to eat, or you didn't go to a shopping center just to shop. Now, 20 years ago, it started to be a place of entertainment. You'd go and spend the whole day. Yeah. Can't go to Disney? Go to the mall. That's what was going on then. Yeah. And then, of course, somebody had mentioned cell phones have become more reliable and more affordable. Ten years ago was Facebook. 300 cable TV stations. Yeah. Reality TV was introduced to the world. Now, that might be a reality, but there's not a whole lot of reality to reality TV. But that's a whole other sermon. 24-hour okay. news. Not only, you know, it was introduced earlier, the decade before, but in the past 10 years or so, I believe, 24-hour news is now making the news and not just reporting the news. And I think that's something we should be paying attention to. Uh, here's something that I came up with. Most graduating high school seniors 10 years ago were getting a car upon graduation or shortly thereafter. Yeah. Al-Qaeda, nobody mentioned Al-Qaeda, waging war in many places started 10, 12 years ago. Text messaging was invented with your phone. 
and digital television and high definition. Uh, those were all invented within the last 10 years. In the last five years, watch, with, watch some of this stuff. Many of our children have cell phones. I'm talking about children who are eight and nine years old. They have cell phones. And not only do they have cell phones, but their parents probably justify that, and justly so, because they consider it a necessity for the safety of our children. That is a big cultural change. Twitter has become the number one uh, uh, cell phone account. Uh, social media reports on things like revolutions and disruptions of governments and civil wars are happening all around the world. And as they are happening, as the bullets are flying overhead, people are twittering the news before the news networks ever get there. Um, I mentioned in the, uh, uh, at 10 years, uh, most graduating Kids were getting cars, now they're getting their cars by the age of 16. You know, they get their license, they get their car. Um, and internet shopping has become the most popular way to shop. Isn't that something? All of that stuff over the last 5, 10, or 20 years. And some of those, while they might seem very subtle, such as cable TV, has done an incredible job in changing the culture in which we live. Now, let me ask you another question. How has our church culture changed in the last five years, or 10 years, or 20 years? Well, if you look back upon the church 20 years, and maybe even longer, you'll discover that for the most part, our church culture has not changed. Now, except for the advent of contemporary worship and the popularity of praise music, uh, we are still continuing to work and move in the world as if we were still set in the 20th century. Even beyond, you know, 1960s, 1950s. How is the church supposed to do effective ministry to the rapidly changing world of the 21st century when we continue to do the work of the church as if we still live in the 20th century. Well, I have a video that I want to share with you that speaks to this issue, and I want you not only to watch the video, but take it home with you. Let it drive its message here. I'll always remember 1961. The space race began, the Yankees won the World Series, oh, and that's the year the construction boom came to our neighborhood. At one end of the it was huge and real traditional looking. The great big tall steeple that you could see all over town. At the other end of the street, they built a grocery store. It was big too. I mean, it had just about everything a 10 year old boy in 1961 could ever dream of. Well, a lot can happen in 12 years. And by the time 1973 came around, my neighborhood had changed a lot. The old grocery store was nothing like I remembered it. As a kid, you know, it had space-age food in the back and electric cash registers up front. At the other end of the street, that big traditional-looking church, well, it was pretty much the same. By 1984, pretty much everybody I knew as a kid had moved out of my neighborhood. Now, there were so many different people living there, and they spoke so many different languages. That old grocery store was certainly not what it used to be either. Now it sold all kinds of foreign food, food with names I couldn't even pronounce. And at the other end of the street, that church with the great big tall steeple, well, things still hadn't changed too much there. Well, my old neighborhood has never stopped changing. Today, young families are moving back in. Kids are playing up and down the street that I used to play on. And as for the grocery store, it's still changing with the neighborhood. Now it seems all you can find on the shelves is health food. I guess it's not been easy, all that change. But it seems like that old grocery store has always been willing to do it if it meant bringing in new business. As for that church at the other end of the street, well, just this last time I visited, I noticed for all these years, it's finally changed too. Last week was annual conference, and at annual conference, 
the Florida conference closed down seven churches. Uh, my home church in Warren, Ohio, the church I grew up in and went to vacation Bible school in and learned the Lord's Prayer, which Dennis led us in today, uh, the, the church where I got my Eagle Scout Award as a Boy Scout, the church that Peggy and I were married in, uh, the church that when we were growing up worshipped 700 people, they will be closing their doors as of Memorial Day this year. Why? One of the reasons is the church has not changed to meet the needs of our communities around us. The Apostle Paul says this about our role as Christians. He says, I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in its blessings. I like that. Maybe you've heard this saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Paul's philosophy in that scripture passage is very similar to that old teaching. Actually, what Paul is seeking to do is to basically teach us how to relate to all sorts of people so that we can share the good news of Jesus with as many as possible. Jesus says in Matthew 28 this, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. We know that that lesson is a part of the Great Commission. The mission of the local church, you see, the commission of Jesus commissioned us to go on a mission. And the mission of the church, our mission, is to go out there into the world amongst us and to share the good news of Jesus, to teach the lessons that he has taught. Even more than that, our mission is to bring people to Jesus so that Jesus can draw them to the grace of God. Well, how can we accomplish that in this, the 21st century? Well, the answer to that is by being people who practice what have been long-time spiritual disciplines. The five things that we have been talking about in this church since Easter are the things that the church calls spiritual disciplines, at least some of the spiritual disciplines. And what we've been talking about are these five things, radical hospitality, passionate worship, intentional faith development, extravagant generosity, and risk-taking mission and service. The five practices of fruitful living are disciplines for the building of stronger Christians and a more effective, relevant church. Disciplines are simply the fundamental skills needed to do a job. Our life in Christ has uh, two growth goals. Uh, it's, it's important that we always keep these two growth goals uh, in, in our forefront. But the first, for example, is that we settle ourselves in the arms of the Lord, that we draw ourselves close to him and learn what it is to be people of faith. That's number one. The second one is to take that which we've learned and what we've experienced and go out and transform the world. Yeah. The, the, the church of Jesus Christ in the 21st century is to be a church that transforms it by sharing with the world the grace of God. For the study that we've been doing um, over the last uh, month or so, and we're going to be, continue to be doing, um, is based on the premise that regularly repeating and deepening certain fundamental beliefs or certain fundamental practices enable us to cooperate with God in our own maturing as Christians. And then as we do that, it then enables us to reach out beyond ourselves to draw others and enable others to see Christ also. 
Christian practices. That's what we're talking about. Christian practices are those essential activities that we repeat and deepen over time. Repeat and deepen. Repeat and deepen. Repeat and deepen. And what they do is they create openings for God to be able to do his work in us and in the world around us. Practice makes our faith a tangible and visible part of our daily life. During the rest of this summer and into the fall, Dennis and Nancy and I will be preaching and teaching about the five practices. But before I left on my extended you know, sabbatical leave here, I wanted to be sure that you understood that what we are talking about is the, the, the act of practicing, actually practicing these things until we get better at them. Like we've mentioned in the, in the past few weeks, practice makes perfect, right? Practice makes perfect, no matter how old or young you are. I love that little boy up there on the ping pong table, don't you? Yeah. He hasn't missed one, has he? They don't look too close. They're looping it every third or fourth ball. <laughs> That's pretty good. I want to ask you something. Um, we're talking about practicing until practice makes perfect. Uh, share with me some of the things that maybe you have practiced through that now you're better at something. You chose to get good at something, and it has required practice, maybe study. Uh, what are uh, some of the things that you have done that maybe over the last five or 10 or even 20 years, because you have practiced it, you've gotten better at? Anybody want to share? Nothing? You got, <laughs> oh, up there, yes. When? Playing the drums. Playing the drums. There you go, great, thank you, yeah. Uh, Richard on the organ. He continues to practice and, and those musical instruments. Yes, sir. Golfing. Golfing. Yeah. You're, so you are better now than you were ten years ago. Now, this man is so excited about golfing. I don't know what days. Wednesdays. I almost ran over him with the car the other day because he pulled right out in front of me. He had to get over to that golf course. <laughs> Speak. Uh, being able to stand up here and speak and preach, Nancy started going to Toastmasters uh, seven or eight years ago, and is finding that to be a, a great help. Yeah. Uh, speaking of golf, yeah. um, my two sons love to golf. Uh, Aaron lives in Alaska, and Jason lives in Ohio, and they started with the teenagers. And I always felt so warm and appreciated when they invited me to go along on their golf outings. Uh, I did that for a few times till I realized that the reason they were really dragging Dad along was so that Dad would pick up the tab. <laughs> but I watched the two of them grow in the sport and enjoy golfing. Jason, the one in Ohio, seems to love golf more than Aaron in Alaska. But Aaron is the better golfer. Now, why is that? because Aaron practices. All Jason does is dream about golfing, think about the next time he's going to go golfing, polish his golf clubs, whereas Aaron, the one in Alaska that has a real short golfing season, as often as he can, he gets out there to golf, he takes lessons, he goes with people who know how to golf better than him. So while Jason might love the sport more than Aaron, Aaron is the better golfer because he practices. Now, many of you here remind me of my two sons when it comes to living out your Christian walk with God. Now, what I mean by that is um, you all love Jesus. You all get excited about walking the walk with Christ. It warms your heart. It maybe even helps you to discover your bigger purpose in life. But some of you are much better at it than others. Why? Because some of you practice it more intentionally than the others of you. For example, some of you pray often. Some of you read your Bible a lot. 
You serve in some sort of ministry here at the church. You intentionally set up your life to do that. You know. Some of you offer yourself as church leaders, and some of you spend a lot of time in private reflection upon things such as the scriptures and different ways in which to worship. But then some of you don't do any of that. Some of you don't practice the things of your faith, and then you wonder why you don't have a stronger faith. Uh, a few days ago, I shared a lesson with Taylor Gothels uh, before she went into the hospital. Uh, she came by our offices to, to visit with uh, me and Nancy and to meet Dennis, and we just sat there with their family, and we just chatted about a bunch of things. And I shared with her a lesson about what it was to be a spiritual person. And I said to Taylor, I said, Taylor, going into the hospital, you have three things going for you. One, you have an incredible medical science. The All Children's Hospital in St. Pete is a John Hopkins hospital, one of the most premier research hospitals in the world, especially when it comes to cancer. And she's over there. And I said, you've got some of the best medical doctors and technicians in all of Florida there to work with you. That's one thing. Second thing you have is yourself. You know? She is an incredibly healthy young girl. If you look at her, you wouldn't believe that she had stage 4 lung cancer. You just wouldn't believe she had a sarcoma. But, but, so she's got her health. She's got her youth. Yeah. And she's got her spirit. She just has a strong spirit about conquering this, about going into the unknown. Talk, you know, a 15-year-old who's never been sick, how in the world do you know what they're going to be poking and prodding and... And yet she's gone into it all with that kind of emotional strength. Yeah. And then I told her that she has a third thing that she needs to take to the hospital. She needs to take the understanding that she is a spiritual person. Because we have within us all kinds of spiritual resources that are available to us that God has placed in us as people who have a soul yeah, and who have a, a future with Jesus not leave this stuff dormant in us, although we tend to often leave our spiritual side dormant. So I told her to take her spiritual side with her into the hospital, and, and we taught a little bit about how to do that. You know, one of the things that maybe we've all read at some point or another in our life is we've, we've read it from, uh, from doctors and research scientists and probably psychologists and, and other sociologists, those who have studied the brain. They tell us that humanity probably only uses 10% of our brain power. Well, as a pastor, I look up amongst the congregations. I've been doing this now for like 36 or 37 years. And I have to say that most Christians only use up to maybe 10% of their spiritual capacity and resources. There's so much more to us that can be uh, tapped in the things of God. And so we shared that with her and she she went away um, with that understanding and I know she got it because the illustration that we used with Taylor was um, first off I had to ask her if she'd ever seen the game Pac-Man or Miss Pac-Man I mean she's only 15 Pac-Man came out when I was like 15 that was what 15 years ago so <laughs> and, 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 and I said you know that little Miss Pac-Man you know she, she's doing this she, she's going after those ghosts you know, the, the ghosts are your cancer, Taylor, I told her. And Miss Pac-Man is the spiritual resources in you to attack your cancer. So Peggy and I went up to visit her Friday night. That was her first night in the hospital. And she has this big screen TV. And guess what? I walked in the room and Pac-Man was on. Yeah. That was one of the games that, that's in the, in the game console in her room. Yeah. So, and sure enough, what, 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 as I was leaving, she's playing Pac-Man. Yeah. Yeah. We, we are spiritual people. And therefore, we are people who need to use our spirit. Yeah. So I told her, I said, you know, of those three things, of the medical science, of your own body and the health and the youth that you do have, the third one is the most important. You are a spiritual being. Tap those resources. 
Okay, well now, why do I mention all of this? I mean, it seems like maybe the sermon has scattered all over the place from practice makes perfect to radical hospitality to discussions about our inner spiritual resources. Uh, what am I trying to get at? Well, let's return to the beginning of the sermon to find out. If you remember, I started out by speaking about how our culture has so radically changed over the last 20 years. However, the church hasn't been doing much changing. We still look and act like the church of the 20th century, even earlier than that. We look like the church of 50 and 60 and 70 years ago. That certainly doesn't help the church to be a strong voice for good in our modern day society. And it doesn't help get the message of Jesus out into the hearts of people who need him as their savior.